The voice of rejoicing and salvation is in the tabernacles of the righteous. The right hand of the Lord do it valiantly. The right hand of the Lord is exalted. The right hand of the Lord do it valiantly. I shall not die, but live, and declare the works of the Lord. The Lord had chastened me sore, but he had not given me over unto death. Open to me the gates of righteousness, and I will go into them. I will praise the Lord. This gate of the Lord into which the righteous shall enter. I will praise thee, for thou art, thou hast heard me, and art become my salvation. The stone which the builders refused has become the headstone of the corner. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day which the Lord had made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Save now, I beseech thee, O Lord. O Lord, I beseech thee, send now prosperity. Blessed be he that cometh in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you out of the house of the Lord. God is the Lord, which hath showed us light, buying the sacrifice with cords, even unto the horns of the altar. Thou art my God, I will praise thee. Thou art my God, I will exalt thee. We will give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, yes, sir. for his mercy endureth. Amen. 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 Now we have a prayer from our pastor. Let us realize our eyes are always upon us. Uh, looking to find evil in us, uh, find thought in our walk, in our conversation, uh, in the life that we live. But uh, let us walk in the integrity of your word. Uh, always standing sure footed uh, on the strength of your word. Uh, in the name of Jesus, in word and in deed, I have mercy today that none can find guilt or shame I, with the believer. I, in the name of Jesus, I, have mercy today, Lord. I, have mercy today, Lord. I, have mercy today, Lord. I, thank you, thank you. Bless the man of God that will show your truth today, Lord. Let your word come forward with a mighty unlearned. Give us a year to hear your truth and your word. I, Thank you, Lord Jesus. You. Have mercy today, Lord. Lord Bless the choir members of every auxiliary today, Lord. Uh, deacon and so forth, I pray, Lord. Uh, Minister in our midst, Lord. Uh, that we get busy doing that which you call us to do, Lord. Yeah, yeah. Lift our voices, I pray. Live the life you call us to live, I pray, yeah, Lord. Yeah. Extend ourselves, Lord. Reach out in ministry and mission, I pray, Lord. Uh, put a burden in our hearts for those that are lost. Uh, Thank you, Lord Jesus, you. not for our fame or glory, but for your name's sake, yeah. for your glory, that your name be praised and magnified. Yeah. Thank you, not only at home, but abroad. Yeah. Remember the members that have come through these doors, Lord. Yeah. Some are living outside the country, some are living in other states and so forth. Yeah. We know your God everywhere. Yeah, everywhere. Some are even our offspring and whatnot, Lord. Yeah. But you are God everywhere. Yeah. And everywhere thou art God. Yeah. Save them, I pray, Lord. Yeah. Draw them to the sheepfold, I pray, Lord. Yeah. Let them remember their vows they off they committed to you, Lord. Yeah. Deliver them from the hands of the enemy, Lord. Yeah. Uh, grant them victory and the walk in victory, Lord. Uh, in your will and in your way, Lord. Uh, that they find church shelters. Sit on the sound doctrine, Lord. Yeah. Live the life that you call them to live. Uh, thank you. So many doctrines out there, Lord. Uh, so many lies out there. So many deceivers out there, Lord. Uh, so many that pull out their soul. Uh, have mercy. Give them victory today, Lord. Uh, we, we submit them in your head if you watch over their soul. Uh, Best of the fine church, shout the Lord. Uh, when they give themselves to you, Lord. Uh, have mercy on the Lord. Uh, and bless your name and worship you in spirit and in truth, Lord. Uh, thank you. And hey, can you then walk up the Kevin King's Highway, Lord? Uh, in the name of Jesus, we bless your name. Bless your name. We bless your name. Let none leave the way they come in, but bless spiritually above all. Bless them with a closer walk with thee, Lord. Uh, a burden to live saved, sanctified, holy lives, uh, day in and day out. Uh, let there be peace, love, and joy in our homes. We cast our spirit of schism, division, strife, confusion, lie, rumor. Have ever seen the enemies planted in our home uh, and among our kindred, Lord. Uh, Give us the victory, Lord. Victory. Give us deliverance therefrom, I pray, Lord. In the name of Jesus, certainly within good hope, Lord. Have mercy today, Lord. Bring a spirit of unity, Lord. Remove the scales from our eyes, Lord. The lies that have gone through, the doctrines that we receive that's contrary to your word. But let your word take precedence over every lie. 
Yeah. Every false doctrine, Lord. Yeah. Uh, open our eyes and understand we might see your truth, your word. Uh, that your word remains the same yesterday, today, forevermore. Yeah, Lord. We change. Yeah. Have mercy, Lord Jesus. Yeah. But your word don't change. Yeah. Thank you, you spoke it from the beginning. Yeah. And it still means the same today, Lord. Yeah. We bless your name today, Lord. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Be praised, be glorified, be magnified today, Lord, yes, sir. in this house today. Yes, in Jesus' name we pray. In Jesus name. Amen. amen. And amen. 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 Yes. Use our lungs and the breath that God gave us yes. and give it right back to him. Say, Lord, I love you. I thank you. Yes. Well, give me strength to be here today, Lord, yes. and to lift my voice. I don't want somebody else to praise for me. Right. I come to praise for myself. Yes. You've been good to me in my home. Thank you, Lord. Heal my sick and deliver us.
time. And he didn't have to allow us, but he saw fit to allow us to gather together today. And that's something that we should never take lightly. That's something that we uh, as believers should uh, look forward to. It's being in the presence of God. Amen. And when we're in the presence of God, we should have a heart to hear from God. Yes. Not just come to check off a box. Oh, yeah. Not just to come and see what someone has on. Amen. Not just to come to socialize, but to come to get in the presence of God. Oh, yeah. We now got to understand and realize that church is not a game. For so long, people have made church into the big, the greatest show on earth. Yeah, everyone come to see the festivities and the activities, but not to get in his presence. There's coming a day, and the day is getting close, but God is getting fed up. What church has it been? Same old, same old. No power behind it. No manifestation of gifts behind it. Same old form and formalities, week in and week out. No life being changed. No life being transformed. Same old thing. God is calling. He's stirring up the nest. It's time for each of us to look at ourselves. Not the preacher. Not the pastor. Look at ourselves as individuals. What are we doing to help the church? Or what are we doing to hinder the church. Oh. Being a prophet of God, sometimes uh, it comes with a, a daunting task. Yes, sometimes you gotta upset folk. Yes. Sometimes you got to make them feel uncomfortable. Sometimes that the word gives you to tell them, you know it's not going to sit right with them. No, no, no. But you got to do what thus said the Lord. Because the fact of the matter is, you don't have a heaven or hell to put me in. I don't have a heaven or hell to put you in. But we all got to give account one day. Oh, yeah. For sure. For sure. Of every ball of deed done in this body. Whether you want to or not. The real of your life going to be played one day. Whether you want to believe it or not. You're real, you're going to have to give account of what you have done. Yes. Good or bad. Pretty or ugly. The lay person as well as the preacher. So that's why it's important as being a preacher, a prophet of God, you have to understand and know that you cannot and should not take this thing lightly. You have to understand that when you mount this 
podium, you have to make sure that you have uh, consecrated yourself. Yeah. You have to make sure that you have, in other words, spent some time before God. Yeah. To heal what thus said the Lord. Just for a few moments, let's turn to the book of Matthew, 15th chapter. Matthew, the 15th chapter. We'll start reading at the first verse. We're going to read the first through the 20th verse. And you'll find these words. Then came Jesus, <coughs> then came to Jesus scribes and Pharisees, which were of Jerusalem, saying, Why do thy disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? For they wash not their hands when they eat bread. But he answered and said unto them, Why do ye also transgress the commandment of God by your tradition? For God commanded, saying, Honor thy father and mother. And he that curseth father or mother, let him die the death. But ye say, Whosoever shall say to his father or his mother, it is a gift by whatsoever thou mightiest be profited by me. And honor not his father or his mother, he shall be free. Thus have ye made the commandment of God of none effect by your tradition. Ye hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy of you, saying, this people draw it nigh unto me with their mouth and honoring me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. And he called the multitude and said unto him, Hear and understand. Not that which goeth into the mouth defileth a man, but that which cometh out of the mouth, that this defileth a man. Then came his disciples and said unto him, Knowest thou that the Pharisees were offended after they heard this saying? But he answered and said, Every plant which my heavenly Father had not planted shall be rooted up. Let them alone. They be blind leaders of the blind. And if the blind lead the blind, both shall fall into the ditch. Yes. Then answered Peter and said unto him, Declare unto us this parable. Hmm. And Jesus said, Are ye also yet without understanding? Do not ye understand that whatsoever enter enter it in, in at the mouth, go into the belly, and is cast out into the drought. But those things which proceed out of the mouth come from the heart, and they defile the man. For out of the heart proceeded evil thoughts, murderers, adulterers, fornications, theft, fault witnesses, blasphemies. These are the things which defile a man. But to eat with unwashed hands defile not a man. We'll stop right there. And just for a few minutes, speak from the subject matter, the stronghold of tradition. Lord, no mercy. The stronghold of tradition. When I was in prayer, God gave me a word for the church. 
And he spoke to me and said, this is a pivotal year for the church. Now when I looked up that word pivotal, it said being of vital or central importance. <coughs> In other words, crucial. We have to understand that it is important, it is imperative that we as the church do as we are to be supposed to do. Amen. The church has become a place where people feel as though they can say anything. do anything. Not only from the pew, but the pulpit. We have to understand that by being a pivotal time in a crucial situation, we need to be mindful of what we speak. That word that you speak may cause someone to transgress. That word that you speak may cause someone to turn right around and never come back. We have to understand and realize that we as individuals have to examine ourselves. I can preach all day, but until you examine your own heart to see if you're lining up with the word of God, you're just going to miss what thus said alone. You have to understand and know that, that this is a personal walk. The church is a hospital. People who sick go to the hospital. Uh, people who sick should go to the hospital, let's say that. Because you know most men we get sick as we try to fight it ourselves. But the thing about a hospital is a hospital, when you come in, you, you, you let the doctor know what your symptoms are. And then letting the doctor know what your symptoms are, he come up with a plan to get you back in good health. But the only way that you can get help and get over your sickness, you have to let the doctor know what your symptoms are. And the only way you can let the doctor know what your symptoms are, you have to make your way into the hospital. Sometimes when we go to the hospital or you see the, the wait time is two hours, you turn around. That's too long. I don't want to wait that long. And people turn around from the hospital for many different reasons. Or they don't like this doctor or that doctor or whatever the case. But the thing about it, sometimes when, 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 when outsiders come into the church, <coughs> Those who beat up by the world. Those who have drug habits. Those who have uh, uh, burdens. And those who are living a life outside the will of God. Those who don't dress like us or look like us or have their hair like us come in. And, and if we look at them the wrong way. Or we tell them they're not dressed appropriate. Or we tell them that. They shouldn't come in when after they've been drinking or they've been smoking or they smell like a pack of cigarettes. They go right back out and they didn't get the help they came in for. We got to realize that the only way men is saved, they got to come through God. Are you going to let what you believe or how you feel hinder the move of 
of the Holy Ghost. See, what, you, what we got to understand is, look, uh, uh, yes, God can do what he wants to when he sees fit, how he wants to, but the Holy Ghost only going to move when God says move. If we don't cultivate or set an atmosphere for the Holy Ghost to have his way, the Holy Ghost not going to have his way. So if we constantly pushing them away, if we constantly not setting the atmosphere for God to move, God will not move. And if God doesn't move, you just plain church. Be honest, you're just wasting your time. Because if you come in and get into the presence of God, you're wasting two hours. You could have been at home cooking. You could have been at home watching the game. You could have been at home watching paint dry because you got the same effect. At one point, you're going to realize, we're going to realize that we got to do things better. At one point, we're going to realize that if we're not letting the Holy Ghost have his way, we're wasting time. At what point are we going to realize that if we don't let the Holy Ghost do what the Holy Ghost want to do, we are wasting time. And the thing about it is, look, time is the one commodity you can't get back. You can waste money, but you can get it back. You can waste food, but you can buy some more. Can't get no time, man. So the time that, that has been wasted and has been wasted on, on, on foolish things is gone. But the thing about it is that you can learn from those things, the time that was wasted, and do things better in the future. I'm reminded that I had went and preached at a church. This was some years, a few years back, and and the preacher, I'm not gonna mention his name. He came up to me afterwards and he said, he said, man, he said, uh, you got all the mannerism that every preacher wants. And he thought he was giving me a compliment. And I wrestled with that thing for a good while. And, 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 and I realized that because I was raised a certain way, I portrayed myself a certain way. I carried myself a certain way. And I preached a certain way. I wasn't allowing God to do what he wanted to do. Because I was, I, I wasn't taught, but I saw it presented a certain way. So I felt the only way to be affected, it got to be presented that way. Well, that's not the case. Because see, the fact of the matter is God gave everybody a different level of anointing. So the way I deliver it may not be the way you deliver it, and it may not be the way he delivered or she delivered, but if it's the word of God, it's going to prick and convict. Yeah. And we got to realize that, 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 that when he said that, I was like, it, it caused me to really examine myself and realize that I don't want the mannerism, I want the presence. Right. See, see, see that, that's, that's a big difference. Look, you can have the mannerisms. I can hoop and holler and yell, hit the podium and, ah, and all these different things and have the mannerisms, but if there ain't no presence of God in me, then it's a waste of time. It'll tickle your fancy, you know, make you poke your chest out and, and, you, and you know you can sing in, in a certain way and, and flip your hand and all these different things, but if there ain't no presence. If there's no presence of God, it's a waste of time. Stronghold of tradition. Look, 
The Bible tells us, it says, Look, come unto me all ye that are heavy, let that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. The world is a, a vicious beast. The world is a beast. You know, when you become 18, you figure you a man. You figure you're ready to take on the world. You figure you know something. And as a man, 46, God said the same, uh, 45 before the 60s year, I still don't know nothing. The world is a vicious beast. And the thing about it, the world will beat you up and it will tear you down. But, but when the people are looking for a refuge, the church should be their refuge. Not that hindrance. Not that stumbling block. Not that place where they feel uncomfortable or don't want to be. Because they're looked down upon. Instead of prayed for, instead of loved, instead of saying, look, I know, I've been where you at. Let me tell you what God can do for you like he done for me. But then we wonder why you don't see certain people or younger people. Because the fact of the matter is, Look, a sinner know he a sinner. No question about it, a sinner know he a sinner. Just like a saved person know they saved. Ain't nothing that you can do to deter them to believe they not saved once they know they saved. So if a sinner know he a sinner, why you got to tell him he a sinner? <laughs> Nobody got to tell me I'm a Christian, I know I'm a Christian. So if a sinner know he's a sinner, don't beat him upside the head because he is a sinner. He know he's a sinner. That's why he came in here. To get help. Because he's sick. And you're going to send him back out there sick for the beast to eat him alive. Look, when you look at that word stronghold, definition I saw it say a place that serves as a center of affection or any group sharing certain opinions or attitudes. One thing about a stronghold, a stronghold for, for if I could give you a visual, if you could just imagine a neck with a uh, two hands around and squeezing the life out of them. That's a stronghold. Something that has a grip on you that's suffocating you. That's killing you. And you don't even know you're being choked. That's a bad situation to have, to have a stronghold and don't even know you have a stronghold. When we look at this word tradition, it says a Christian doctrine or a body of doctrine regarded as having been established by Christ, all of the apostles, though not contained in Scripture or through Scripture, misinterpretation. We have to understand and realize that the Bible was written by man, but it was inspired by God. Right? So, if it was written by man and inspired by God, in order for you to get a clear understanding of it, you got to ask the Holy Ghost to give that to you. Yes. Not just pick it up like it's a regular book and then go at it and take it from take it for face value. Because it's not a book that you read and you take the word as face value off the page. You got to get revelation from God to get the living word off the paper. Not just the, the letters off the paper, the living word off of the paper, out of the book. If you don't ask God to take the scales off your eyes, you just read a book with no effect, no power behind it. Lord. 
That's why it's important for us when we read the Bible to set the atmosphere. That's why it's important for us when we come together to fellowship and worship God, we set the atmosphere. If you don't set the atmosphere for God to move, or, or, or you don't set the atmosphere for you to get a fresh revelation of the word, guess what? You won't get it. We got to realize that. You can read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. And if God don't give you no insight or the Holy Spirit don't give you no insight or no revelation, you're going to miss it completely. Not only will you miss it completely, but you'll misinterpret all kind of things. Misinterpret all kind of things, make it to believe and say what you want it to say. But when you have a stronghold, you don't realize that you're doing that. Because you figure you just check the box off on your to-do list for the week. I didn't set a, I set aside time to spend with God. I didn't set aside time to go to church. I didn't set aside time to, to hear a praise and worship song. And you didn't get nothing out the whole situation. See, for so long, people have, like I said earlier about the mannerisms, people have learned how to play church so well. Oh, it's gonna be it's gonna be tight in here today. Look, 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 look. People have learned to play church so well to the point to where you thought you fooled God. <laughs> you have played church for so long and so well that you thought you was getting off on God, but God sees your heart. God sees your heart. I may not see your heart. But God sees your heart. But we have been, uh, for the lack of a better word, fooled to think we're doing right. And the whole time you're doing wrong. Because you have the mannerisms now. You have the attire down. You have the smell. You smell. You have the smell down. You have the hand gestures down. But the whole time your heart is black. The whole time your heart is not pure. But you can tip because you got the mannerism down. And in your mind, you saved and going to heaven. Mm -hmm. I'm reminded of the scripture where the Bible said that the minister he told him, said, look, I have healed so many in your name. Yeah. Mannerism. Yeah. See, and, and, and see, and see right there, we have to realize, he said, look, I hear so many in your name. Mm -hmm. See, when you call on God, he coming. And, you, and, and, and see, you don't, and what we got to realize, you don't have to be perfect for God to use you. You don't have to be in, quote unquote, the perfect situation for the Holy Ghost to move. I know everybody here been saved, but, 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 but maybe you ain't never been in a situation where you was in a place you didn't have no business being and God started talking to you. Yeah. You in a place where you know you don't belong, your heart is not where it is, and yet still God's still telling you what he wants you to do. Yeah. See, God not looking at your condition and where you're at. He's looking at who he called you to be. And oftentimes we look at who they are and where they're at now and completely missing what God is calling them to be. And by doing that, they turn around and they leave. 
that we find here, look, it says that uh, then they came to Jesus Christ saying, the Pharisees, which were of Jerusalem, saying, why do thy disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? For they wash not their hands when they eat bread. So they came to Jesus. The scribes, the priests, the, the elders, they came to Jesus in Jerusalem and, and they asked him, he said, look, look, they came from Jerusalem to Galilee where he was. From, I mean, they came to, from Galilee to Jerusalem where he was. And they came to basically question Christ. Yeah. They didn't got wind of he round here. His disciples, the ones who in his inner circle, the ones who he ministered to and spent time with, they are not upholding the tradition. So they figured they was going to go and they was going to get this thing straight with Jesus. Because surely Jesus was going to be on their side with this situation. Surely Jesus was going to agree with what they had to say because it was the tradition. It was the norm. What they failed to realize that there's nothing traditional about the ministry of Christ. Right. Nothing traditional about the ministry of Christ. He was born untraditional. He lived untraditional. And he died untraditional. And he rose untraditional. But yet still, we want to keep him in a traditional phase. That's not who he is. But these scribes and these Pharisees had their mind so fixed on tradition that they knew Christ was going to side with them. Right. See, see the thing about a, 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 a stronghold of a tradition, even when you're wrong, you think you're right. I'm going to say that one more time for the people in the back. Even when you're wrong, you think you're right. These Pharisees, they thought they were on point with it. But look, but look, look, Christ came and he said, look. But he answered and said unto them, why do ye also transgress? The commandment of God by your tradition. Yes. Now then he came to Christ. And they figured he was about to side with them and say, yeah, they wrong for that. The disciples wrong for not washing their hands before they partake of the bread. Them being so smart as they thought they were, didn't even realize they were talking to the great I am that I am. See, the thing about it is they were so caught in a tradition, they didn't even realize they in the presence of holiness. See, the thing about being caught up in the tradition, you won't realize when you're in the presence of holiness. Because I say that nothing traditional about what Christ does. The miracles he's done. How he fed the people with two fish and five loaves of bread. Let me see you try to feed a multitude of people with two fish and five loaves of bread. I don't care how much you pray over it. I don't care how much you figure you can cut it into small pieces. I guarantee you, you can't do it. But they figured that he was going to side with them and he turned and he said, look, why do ye also transgress the commandment of God by your traditions? He going to turn to them and basically say, okay. You, you, may, you may have a little point there, but why are you transgressing? All right. See, a lot of times we point the finger. He was wrong for coming in there like that. She was wrong for coming in there with a leg hanging out. 
But she was wrong for coming in there with her head uncovered. But you gotta realize that that don't, that's not what make you see. But because your tradition make you feel that way, anything that don't line up with it is wrong and is a sin and outside the will of God. And that's not the case. There's a saying that says, and look, 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 before you can clean a fish, you gotta catch it. And there's also another saying I like to say when, when, uh, when people ask me certain things, uh, especially when it comes to church. Now look, the principles that are in the scriptures don't change. The word of God don't change. But delivery does. I can recall as a young boy when we would go fishing. Matter of fact, my cousin Moran take us out there fishing. We used to fish with worms. Nowadays, you can try to go fish with a worm and see what they still talk about. Look at you crazy. You fish with shrimp nowadays, right? But the object was we trying to get some food on this line. Just because we was using worms and you using shrimp don't mean we both not fishing. Just because it don't fit into how you perceive it's supposed to, how, how I'm supposed to fish, that don't mean I'm not fishing. We got to understand and realize that, that it may not look like what you're accustomed to, but that don't mean it's wrong. It might not look how it was years ago. It might not come out how it was taught to you years ago. <laughs> but that don't mean that it's wrong because the word is the word. Oh, yeah. Amen. Amen. We got to understand that. And we got to realize that. I understand things change. What well, time brings about change. When I was a kid, if we inquired or asked the adult about something, anybody around my age or, or a little older or younger would have to, has heard the same thing. When you ask why, they said, because I said so. No explanation. And I did, and you was dead to ask why you said so. <laughs> right? But my son's generation, hmm. or the generation before my son, you ask them, they ask you a question about, but well, why you do thus and so? And you tell one of them because I said so. I guarantee you. You're not gonna get the response you think. Because see the fact of the matter, to as time change, people become more inquisitive. And they wanna know more, and they wanna seek more, and they wanna know why is the reason, why is this happening this way? See, before you could get away with just saying, because I said so. But kids today, you can't tell them that. You have to give them an explanation as to why. And what I'm saying is that when it comes to the word of God, always just saying because that's how my daddy did it or my mama did it, it's not the answer that they need to hear. If you can't go to the word and give them an example or explanation about it, then it don't line up with the word. That's why young people are going elsewhere. Because they want the word, 
They seek in the word, but if you don't and take the time to give them what they need, they're not going to come. They're going to find someone who will entertain them and sit in time with them and give them opportunity to learn about the word. It's not that they don't want to be saved or they don't want to live a life pleasing to God. Every generation, God has a remnant. But if you deter them or pushing them away, what you think gonna happen? They doing the about face and they going out the doors. But then you get up, we get upset when we don't see the young folk. Well, you know they just, they just want to live life. Yeah, they live in life so at another church. Just because you see them don't mean they in the world. We gotta stop thinking like that. Just because they're not here, they, they sit it. No. They go someplace else. Because, because I said so, just ain't gonna get it with that generation. We gotta understand people want to see and feel the presence of God. People want to see and interact with God. It's not that no, that, it's not that they don't want to live a life pleasing to God. They want to feel the presence. And how you get in His presence may not be the way that I need to get in His presence. So don't hinder me if I do it a little different. Don't hinder the next person if they do it a little different. Because the ultimate goal is that everyone be saved. It's not how they dress, how their hair look, color of their skin. None of that makes a difference. It's the heart. And the only thing that's going to change that is getting is the anointing going to break the yoke. How do you get to anointing? You got to set the atmosphere. Yes, yes. Hallelujah. To the thing about it, when you set the atmosphere, the Bible tells us, look, where the spirit is, there's liberty. And oftentimes, if you don't, if you don't be careful about what you do and how you do, you set yourself up for failure. You come, you come into a place where you are going to church. But you're not experiencing church. You come into a place where the spirit dwells, but you're totally missing. Because it's not your norm. Or how you were accustomed to. Look, so we find, we go back here where in Christ he says that turn grace and committed the commandment of God by your traditions. For God commanded, saying, Honor thy father and thy mother, and he that cursed for thy mother, let him die to death. Now this hand washing, it wasn't no washing with no soap. It was just taking some water and Simply put it on your hands. A ritual. No scriptural aspect to it at all. A ritual. Because that's what they were accustomed to. That was their tradition. So Christ, he tells them that they transgressed by not obeying the commandment of God for their tradition. See, the problem comes in when you place tradition over the Holy Ghost. Mm. Yes, yes, yes. 
In doing that, you're denying the power of the Holy Ghost. The, the Pharisees had placed so much emphasis on what they were taught that they elevated and made it scriptural. And ignored, by doing that, they ignored the true word of God. Because they thought what they were doing was scriptural. They thought what they were doing was of God. In reality, what they were doing was not of God. In those days, Christ is talking about, in Exodus, they had, uh, they, it, uh, it says 21 and 7, And he that cursed his father, all his mother shall surely be put to death. That's in reference to what Christ is talking to, to the Pharisees about. You said that if you design or you curse your mother or father, you shall surely die. But in those days, Jews had a law called Corban, C-O-R-B-A-N. And basically what it was, the Jew, Jewish sons, not daughters, Jewish sons had to place so much property on the side for their, for their parents. So much money on the side for their parents, for when their parents got old, they would be able to take care of them. Right? Now, in doing that, they perverted that, and they started uh, putting it on the side, saying that it was for God. And that they were going to use it on the side, they used that loophole, per se, and saying that they was putting this on the side for their parents when they would become elder, but the whole time, they was putting it on the side for themselves. And that's where Christ is saying that they transgressing against the word. Because they were setting their own selves up instead of setting up their parents like they were supposed to. We have to realize and understand they made it appear as though they were doing something spiritual. But they actually were doing something to keep their own possessions for themselves. In other words, they had the mannerisms down. But the whole time they were putting their stuff on the side for themselves. They wasn't worried about making sure mom and daddy was good in their old age. They wanted to keep their stuff. So let me skip down to uh, seven verses say, ye hypocrites. Well, did a size prophesy of you saying, this people draw nigh unto me with their mouth and out in me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of man. Christ called them hypocrites. Because you proclaiming one thing and doing something else. You had the mannerisms, but doing something else. You say, you draw nigh to me with your mouth, and I didn't be with their lips, but their heart. Their heart is far from me. They got the mannerism of praying and worshiping and yelling and screaming, but their heart is far from me. They looked the part, but their heart is far from me. He goes on and says, 
In the 10th verse, he said, And he called the multitude and said unto them, Hear and understand. Now look, he's saying, look, in other words, he's saying, look, y'all better pay attention. Look, look, pay attention to what I'm about to tell you. Because, because what he's about to tell you is something vital for your life. Not that which goeth into the mouth defileth a man, but that which cometh out of the mouth defileth a man. Right. Then came his disciples and said unto him, Knowest thou that the Pharisees were offended after they heard these saints? Hmm. Now, Christ spoke to them and said, it's not what going to man that the father, but what coming out of his mouth that the father. And when the Christ told them that, they got offended. Now, Christ being who he is, it should have made the Pharisees realize that something that he was saying was important. What he was saying was valuable. What he was saying had truth in it and was completely true and all truth. But the Pharisees got upset. They got upset because in their minds, what they were doing was right all the time. Because in their minds, that in their minds, they were convinced so much that what they was doing was right that they didn't even realize that they were telling Christ yeah. that he was wrong. Yeah. They were convinced so much that what they were doing was right that they didn't even realize they were telling Christ, nah, you wrong, we right. Yeah. How messed up do you have to be? To not realize that what you are saying is going against what God is telling you. You got to be in a bad situation. To have Christ before you telling you what it is and what it's going to be. But because it don't agree with what you believe is wrong. In the 13th verse, it said, Look, but he answered and said, Every plant which my heavenly father had not planted shall be rooted up. Let them alone. Now, look, look, look. Now, when he's saying that, let them alone, he don't mean he's not saying, Okay, let them alone, leave them alone, let them think. No, in other words, he's saying, Look, leave them alone because they have chosen their own path. Look, I'm trying to tell them what's right. But they don't want to hear what's, what's right, so let them continue to believe what's wrong. Leave them alone. If they won't believe it, believe it. But look, let me tell you what's going to happen if they do believe it. They be blind leaders of the blind. And if the blind lead the blind, both shall fall in a ditch. Now, if you're crazy enough to not believe what Christ telling you, that you have so much uh, uh, belief in what you believe to be true, he say, let them believe it then. Let them think what they're saying is true. Let them think what they're preaching is true. Let them think how they're living is true. They're going to find out one day. Fact of the matter is, uh, you don't have to believe the truth if you don't want to. But the truth is the truth. You can argue with me all day long and tell me the sky is green. That sky is going to be blue all day long. And Christ, he said, look, just leave him alone. Look, we got, look, see, see, Christ understood and realized, look, he knew he had a job to do and he knew he had only so much time. See, see, we got to realize you got to stop wasting time on people who don't want to learn. 
Stop wasting time on people who don't want to understand the word of God. Yeah. Stop wasting time on people who are going to be stiff necked to their own belief in what they believe. Let them believe it. Yeah. Yeah. Christ just said what's going to happen. Look, they're blind. Let the blind lead the blind. Yeah. And they won't end up in a ditch. Let them. But the thing about it is, uh, Christ done his due diligence. Yeah. Yes, sir. Christ gave them the word. Yeah. Told them the word. Yeah. Explained the word. Yeah. That's why he came from, a, uh, when he said, let them alone, he came from an aspect of frustration. Because look, I didn't told you. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't told you what it is. Yeah. But if you don't want to believe it, don't believe it. Christ. I am the son of the true and living God. If you don't believe it, then don't believe it. Look, then Peter, look in the Bible says in the 15th verse, look, Peter said unto him, declare unto us this parable. Look, and Jesus said, are ye also yet without understanding, Peter? Peter, one of his partners, Peter in the inner circle. Peter, how you don't know? Peter, how you without understanding, Peter? I didn't took time to, to, to feed you the word. I didn't took time to not only feed you the word, but live a life uh, according to God's will in front of you. You in the inner circle. How y'all don't understand? You missed the mark. That lets me know one thing. That, that, that again, you have to have the right heart posture. It is Peter in the inner circle. Yet, he missed it. Peter who seen the works firsthand. Peter who seen the works walk firsthand. Peter who was in a presence firsthand. Say, can you give us some understanding? Just, just think about that. How are you in the midst of Christ and totally miss it? Christ being who he is, he said, look, are you yet without understanding? He probably was frustrated at this point. A lot of Pharisees had already came at him sideways, talking to him crazy. He put them in a place, telling them what's right and what's wrong, and now his very own coming at him sideways. Like, how you look? You know what? Look, I'm about to nip this in the bud right now. He said, uh, Do you yet not understand that whatsoever entered in after mouth? Now, look, he's about to go into detail now. In other words, he's saying, Now, look, you didn't understand it. Let me break it down some more. Maybe I, maybe I went over your head that time. Maybe, maybe I used too much of an eloquent speech, eloquent speech for you that time. Or maybe it just wasn't descript descriptive enough for you. So look, this is what I'm going to do. He said, look, that whatsoever entered in at the mouth, he didn't say what entered at the ear or the eye, because the eyes is the gateway to the soul, but he said, look, whatever entered in, go into the mouth, go into the belly. And it's cast out in the draught. But those things which proceeded out of the mouth coming from the heart, and they defile the man. In other words, what you eat is going to come out. Your body going to take the nutrients from it, and the rest is going to expel. But the thing that defiling a man is what is in the heart. Not his clothes. Not what music he listens.
attention to. Not his style of dress. Not his hair choice. Not her hair choice. Not her hairstyle. Not her hair dress. But what coming out of the heart. We got to understand that. We got to understand that and realize it's not what's on the outside. Time to put the mannerism down. And get the heart right. Look, look, we got to get the heart right. He said, look, look, he said, for out of the heart proceeded evil thoughts, murderers, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witnesses, blasphemies. These are the things which defile a man, but to eat and unwashing hands defile it not a man. Wash your hands all day long. If your heart not right, you still defile. I don't care how much you spend on a tailored suit. And I like me a good tailored suit. But if my heart ain't right, I'm defiled. Don't care how much you spend on the best cologne. If your heart is not right, you defiled. I don't care how much you spit on a dress. If your heart is not right, you are defiled. I don't care what color is your dress. If your heart is not right, you are defiled. I don't care if your head is wrapped up. If your heart is not right, you are defiled. We got to get that through our heads. It's our heart, not how we look. Christ is telling them, it's not how you look or what you have on, not even what you eat, but what comes out the heart. That's what defiles a man. We have to realize and understand and know that if we want to see a mighty move of God, look the Bible in John 14, 12, verse 12 and 13, that Jesus is speaking here. He said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me the works that I do, meaning the works that Christ did on this earth. Yes. Yes. Meaning the works that the miracles that Christ did on this earth. Yes. He said, the works that I do, he do. Oh. <coughs> I'll read the Bible now. Oh, yeah. He said, I he do also. Let, let, let that sink in for a minute. He said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do, shall he do also. Where have the works gone? That, that's Christ speaking right there. Just like he told the Pharisees. And he got upset with the Pharisees. Look, we got to believe. Look, if Christ said it, it's going to happen. But the thing about it is, you have to have the right heart posture. The works haven't been done because the heart ain't done. The works haven't been manifested because the heart not there. Look, it say, and greater works then these shall he do. Yes. Greater works. Yes. That shall he do. Y'all yes. know I'm in the funeral business and, 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 and I deal with dead bodies day in and day out, but I'm believing that one day God gonna tell me, tell one of them jokers, get up. Oh, yeah. It's 
gonna come a time where they gonna seek the undertaker, not for me to bury him, but me, good God Almighty, for me to raise him. He say, greater words. Look, we gotta realize, look, 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 you, we gotta get to this point to where it's God or bust. You know how people, they go traveling, they got on the back of their car, uh, San Diego on bus, or California on bus. We got to get to the point where his works are bust. Yeah. Oh. Scripture say greater works. Yeah. I'm looking to see greater. Yeah. How, you get, how you get to the greater? You got to get the heart right. Look, we got to, each of us got to examine ourselves and look and realize, look, 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 if, if all of us, if all of us really examine ourselves, if all of us really, I mean really, if all of us really start examining ourselves daily, if all of us really get in a praise and worship before we come to church, if all of us really fast and pray before we come to church, if all of us really seek God Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, if all of us really got on our face and lay before God when we come in the whole Sunday, we will see the works. We don't see because we don't put in the effort. We don't see because we think it's, it went to the grave. But I just read right there that Christ said, greater works. Not less than what he done. We gotta realize look, if he done all that in the Bible days, he said we're doing greater. So if we ain't seeing greater, we need to check ourselves. <laughs> ain't no sense in talking about what, what uh this one done or this past preacher done or this past missionary done or, or all these people done spent wicked words and all these beforehand. What you what's good at talking about them? Get into the presence so we can see it. So we can see people raising from the dead. So we can see people get their mind back right. So we can see people heal from cancer and all manner of disease. Yes. But that's not going to happen until we get to a place where we put the tradition on the side and get in the presence of the Holy Ghost and let the Holy Ghost rule. Yes. Maybe you content. I'm not content. I won't see that greater. I won't be in the presence of that greater. I want to be in the presence of that greater for my own self to see the miraculous works of God. What good is it to, to have a connection with a God that's all knowing? What good is it to have a connection with a God that sees all and knows all? What good is it to be connected to a God that has all power in his hand and we don't utilize it? What good is it? It's no good. He said they'll do great works. And look, he, he explains why we'll do great works. He goes on to say, because I go unto my father. Not because your last name or, or because I didn't call. Look, he go before his father. Look, father, look, look, they call it on your name right now, father. Look, they got a man that's altar right now that's dying from cancer. Stage four cancer. God, they call it on you. Heal him right now. Don't tell me it can't be done. I done been in situations and places where it has been done. Don't say what God can't do. See, see that's the thing. I have been in situations and places where I've seen the hand of God move. And once you have seen the hand of God move, you're chasing that again. And again. And again. And again. And again. Because you wait for because look when you got a zeal and a and, and a love for God and know that God who He is, you want to 
see those works done. And I want to see the works done. Because I want you to see those works done. I want my children to see the hand of God move. I want my, gra my future grandchildren to see the hand of God move. I want my nieces and nephews to see the hand of God move. I want my siblings to see the hand of God move. I want my, this body of believers to see the hand of God move. He said, because I go to my father and whatsoever. Whatsoever. He didn't say certain things. He said, whatsoever. Whatsoever ye shall ask in my name. Whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I may do. He said, that will I do. He didn't say I might do it. He said, maybe. He didn't say maybe I'll do it. He said, that will I do. So if he's a God that cannot lie, and he said, whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, I will do, then why ain't no miracles taking place? We got to set the atmosphere. We got to set it. We got to set the atmosphere to the point to where it, it, it is so thick in here that when you come in here, you can't see. You got to set the atmosphere for God to move. And he's telling you, look, that whatsoever you should do, ask in my name, that will I do. That the Father may be glorified in the Son. God wants to perform the miracles. Wants to perform the miraculous works. But do we have, the, is our heart defiled? Or is our heart in a place that we're ready to receive? Or is our heart in a place that we're ready to be used by God? Or we just got the mannerisms down pat? I would suggest that each and every one of us examine ourselves. I, I, I dare you this week, each day, really see God face. I don't mean like you normally do. I mean chase him down like he owe you a thousand dollars and you ain't got no money in your pocket. Seek his face. And if all of us begin to seek him and have that hunger and that thirst for him, watch the change that's going to take place. Church of the known will be no more. But we have to change that atmosphere. Christ ready to move whenever we call on him. But do we really want to see him? Do we really want to see the signs and wonders? Do we really want to know the innermost depths of the Holy Ghost? Do we really want to have a heart pure? Are we just content with a defiled heart and the mannerisms of church? Really seeking. Really get into his presence. And if all of us do that, what a change will take place in this place. Amen.
What a change will take place in this body of believers. But we have to all get to that point. That is Christ of us. God bless you and God. Bless you.